Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, Eden. Um, and welcome to this, um, the ASFP webinar on uh, the Building Safety Act for July 2022. Um, we are um, we'll just wait for, we, we've just started, we've opened the thing and there's already 75 attendees dialed in. So we'll just give it a moment before we start to let the last few people come on and then we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll go. Okay. Okay, so numbers are fairly steady. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we've got a, a webinar today on the Building Safety Act. It's going to be presented by myself, Andrew Taylor, and in, in conjunction with my colleague, Niall Rowan, who you hopefully you can see on screen as well, but you can't hear him because he's muted at the moment. He's waving at us. Uh, and we're going to do a, a, a webinar on the subject of the Building Safety Act, although to be honest, what this is a, one of our regular regulatory updates that we'll cover, we'll touch on all sorts of other bits and pieces. Um, some of you will have seen bits of this presentation before because it's a, um, it, it's a development from the one that I gave at the AGM last week, but there we go. So um, in terms of the uh, webinar today. Uh, I've already said welcome and welcome you to it. Um, it does say questions via Q&A uh, chat box and polls on there. Um, we haven't got uh, a Q&A box, which we have done previously, but for some reason for this on this particular occasion, Zoom has decided we can't have. So if you have any questions as we go through, can you put them in the chat box, please? And we will try and get to them as, as we can, and we'll have a bit of Q&A time at the end of the webinar, where Niall and I will try and get to any questions that we can see in the chat box. OK, we've also, as you well know, we use we use the polls function just to to gauge and, and engage with you as the audience while we while we go through this um, webinar. All right. So we'll have a presentation at the end of it. We hope to have a, some time as time allows for Q&A. And then I'll, I'll sum up and close at the end of it. And we're going to run this morning for a, an hour. And we have got, uh, we're CPD accredited. So um, it's uh, email is to info asfp.org.uk if you want a CPD uh, certificate. I will point out to you that we will make this webinar available for people um, uh, by way of a I'll put it on the internet, we're recording it now, we'll put it on the internet af after we've finished. If you are watching it live uh, today, at 12 o'clock on the 13th of July, we can give you a CPD certificate. If you watch the webinar on Catch Up Television, we can't give you a, C a CPD certificate, so please don't ask for one because your, your vote won't be counted and you may still be charged for it. Okay. And so. So basically, we're going to talk about about both the Fire Safety Act and the Building Safety Act today. And there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be talking about with the Building Safety Act in terms of the gateways, the new regulators, um, the secondary legislation on construction products. There's a little bit in there about UKCA marking, and that's a, an evolving piece at the moment. Um, I've also put a, a couple of little slides in about the just to update you in terms of the EC's review of of European construction products regulations. And then of course, at the end of it, it, it wouldn't be one of our webinars if we didn't talk briefly about competence. That will take us hurriedly into the, the Q&A as we go through. And it's at that stage that I'm going to get to poll question one. And hopefully what's going to appear in front of us is, is our first poll question, which is basically, um, what are you interested in? Why are you here? What do you do? We've got a hundred people online. Hmm. 
Okay. So, so our, our results, and hopefully you can see that results sheet um, screen there. Um, you've got uh, a, a broad mix of with the, the big ones of architect, designer, manufacturer, and installer, and a few specifiers, inspectors, and fire risk assessors now. So we've got a, a, a fairly broad mix that we're talking of two today. Um, it's at this point that I'm going to hand over to Niall, and Niall's going to um, go, going to take you through the the, the rest of the of the presentation. And so I will see you at my next bit. Thank you for that, Andy. Um, uh, and thank you for that introduction. We will be passing backwards and forwards, hopelessly, hopefully fearlessly, fairly seamlessly, as is happening now. Um, okay, so building safety bill and the fire safety act, where does all that come back from? And of course, it all comes back from Grenfell and the, the, night, the events of that terrible night about just over five years ago. Uh, Dame Judith Hackett, pictured top right, uh, it, it issued a report called Building a Safer Future, which is a review of the building regulatory system in the UK. And as well as looking at the regulation, she started finding out about a lot of entrenched attitudes in the construction industry. And so the, she picked up very rapidly that the race to the bottom that has been the driver for so long has to stop. And the mindset has to be on doing things properly and safely rather than just doing it as cheap as possible. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, she was a bit late to the game because some of us have been speaking about this for many years ago. Back in 2003, the ASFP produced a report funded by uh, DTI, Department of Trade and Industry, and what uh, the Department of Leveling Up Communities and Housing, whatever they're called this week, um, which was at that time was, was uh, Department of Environment, Transport and the Region, part funded by them. Uh, so it was a jointly sponsored between industry and the department uh, and produced a, a report on recommendations needed to improve design, building control, the culture, etc., and that it needed to be underpinned by legislation. No good saying, just do the right thing, because just do the right thing, as we saw, didn't happen, because that report was issued in 2003. And the conclusion of it, thank you, is uh, in that either conclusion or a quote from the report is there, public safety is being impinged by incorrect passive fire protection measures, and we feel that disaster caused by accelerated or unexpected fires break could follow if no action is taken to improve initial standards and define responsibility of building occupiers. So you can see it, 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 it knew what something was going to happen and it had that kind of background to it. The report was drafted by an ex-ASFP uh, chairman uh, and he was deeply upset when Grenfell happened because he said, we told them this and they just did nothing. Anyway, enough of I told you so. Moving on, a lot has happened in the last five years. I know it feels like to some extent nothing's happened, but a lot has happened. We've had some new legislation. We've got the Fire Safety Act. That's issued by the Home Office, and that reinforces the regulatory reform fire safety order. That's the one where you have to do a fire risk assessment on your building if you run a business. Also, just out are the Fire Safety England Regulations 2022. And what they do is give legal backing to the recommendations for the Grenfell Tower inquiry phase one. Phase one was about a year ago completed. It was had things like uh, uh, flat front doors and various other bits and pieces and, and fire safety measures that need to be said. And this gives legal backing to them, where Sir Martin Morbeck said, I want this to be a change in the law, and that's what's happened. And of course, the main event is the Building Safety Act, which has recently passed. I recently has received royal assent, and that is enabling legislation. It's not the final answer. It's enabling legislation that gives the Secretary of State powers to do lots of things in the, in the hope of implementing all of the 53 Hackett recommendations from Build a Safer Future. So there's a new regulatory regime for high risk buildings, lots more inspection. There's a new regulator, the HSE, and there'll be greater scrutiny of construction products. We'll come on to more of that later and to promote the confidence of those working in all buildings, not just high-risk buildings. 
Next slide, please. So, again, just a bit more detail. The Fire Safety Act passed into law a year ago, and that did the essential thing it did was bring external walls and flat front doors into the scope of a fire risk assessment carried out under the order. Originally, most fire risk assessors did front doors if they could. They didn't do external walls because they were not common part, which was the part that's used. Uh, so you bring flat front doors and walls into the scope of the assessment. Great idea, but there were some problems. First of all, um, it wasn't welcome originally because it re realized that it was probably going to give quite large bills for leaseholders when they realized that their, their cladding needed to be changed. And then that came up, ended up with the whole who pays argument. And the bigger issue is there was and still is a problem of adequately trained and competent fire risk assessors who are capable of, externing, capable of assessing external walls. They could do the door, so that's the easy thing. You can't do the external walls. Um, and so for car, partly because of that, where there's external wall is deemed to be an issue, you know, it's not two layers of brickwork or something or concrete or something like that. They, you know, we, we had the publication of PASS, publicly available specification, 9980, which is a fire risk appraisal of external walls. Quite a complicated document, quite long, a bit hard going, but it has a five step process. And that allows you to assess whether this wall, which, this external wall, which may not be non combustible construction, whether it's suitable or not. Also, problems with the Fire Safety Act is an ongoing one since 2005. There's a competency requirement for fire risk assessors. They've been developed in working group four, that's industry responsible working group four, but they're not being implemented. Still, anybody can be a fire risk assessor. There's no requirement to be certificated or on any of the registers. The Fire Safety Act will be implemented alongside the Building Act. Oh, and one other thing that's come out is something called the Fire Risk Assessment Prioritization Tool. And that is for uh, local authorities and, or, and housing associations and anyone who has a series of external walls that need assessing to be able to work out the priority of, of assessing them, which ones need doing first and which ones don't need doing first. It's not a replacement for PATH 9980, but it, it also might indicate that you don't need to use 9980. Next slide, please. So moving on, um, we move on to um, the, uh, the, the government determined to move on, on three topics. And this came out in, in January of this year. Uh, and that was the first one is the construction industry needs to pay to fix the problems, but fairly obvious, developers must pay. The leaseholders should be protected from huge bills. Um, and also to restore some common sense to, to building assessments. I mean, we know in some cases, even not ignoring um, external walls, fire doors being replaced because of very, very minor infringements, like gaps are slightly too big, etc. And, and sometimes we've moved from a situation, certainly in the passive fire industry in my 10, 15 years, where, oh, that'll do, mate, or we do it cheaper, or we don't worry about that, or oh, a fire will never happen to. Everything's got to be absolutely on the button. And it's kind of gone from one extreme a bit to the other one. There needs to be a bit of, a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, common sense as one fire risker said to me he said if michael gove is going to give me four billion pounds to spend on fire safety i wouldn't spend it on just removing cladding which is a fairly straightforward thing okay um now it comes from a policy announced by by former secretary of state michael gove so i'm just sort of cross him out but we don't know who it's going to be now what we do is it's good at clark uh, so that's great so move on to the next slide please but unfortunately all that deals with is what is above, above the waterline. The industry who caused the crisis will now pay to fix it instead of innocent leaseholders. Great stuff. So we've took a cladding remediation. Um, buildings above 18 metres, they are going to be paid for by the Building Safety Fund and the public purse are going to do that. Buildings of 11 to 18 metres, the government was looking to developers and construction product manufacturers to fund this. Now, the developers signed up a package, but the, the uh, construction product manufacturers, they didn't quite get there, so they're still waiting on that. But more to the point, um, the Defective Premises Act will, if, will, is being extended, the liability period is being extended to 30 years. So there's a whole load of stuff below the waterline 
of other safety defects, including things like fire stopping and other matters, that would still, still be liability. So that is going to be very interesting time for the industry. Next slide, please. So as I say, the large developers are signed up to pay. The discussions with the construction products manufacturer, manufacturers which in, in the form of the CPA, the Construction Products Association, they failed on the basis of it was kind of give us some money. And we said, well, how many buildings do we need? Well, we don't know, but give us some money. I paraphrase that rather, rather crudely. But there was a kind of blank check demand. And the industry said, well, when you, when you do that, when you know, we will do it. There was definitely a move towards supporting that. The developers was a bit different because they knew which buildings they developed. So it was much easier to say, OK, we'll put aside this one. Uh, the remediation on historical turnout issues, I'll cover, I'll cover that earlier. Next slide, please. So housing secretaries come and housing secretaries go. Uh, and the picture on the left is uh, it's a famous Eric Pickles, a picture the inside of the Grenfell Tower inquiry, characteristic pose. Um, after Michael Grove, we have Greg Clark. Uh, for how long? I don't know. If we have a new prime minister, when we have a new prime minister in September, they might improve the new government. Um, so their drive and their vision is going to control, speed up or, or whatever. Um, the current political situation will call delay and also economy versus safety. Um, the, the, PEEPs, personal emergency evacuation plans, were removed from the to be required, and that caused a great outcry. And then some people say, well, it's not practical or realistic. You know, it's not our place, our place to argue there, and you can argue it one way or the other. But you know what's going to happen there, we just don't know till the political situation. Having said that, the basic framework, the Building Safety Bill, Basic Safety Act, Fire Safety Act are there. There's a momentum behind it now that's spent five years growing. It's not going to stop now. It's not, we're not going to get a new, a new prime minister says, well, we're not going to do any of that now. It's just not, it's going to happen, I suspect it will. Michael Gove was actually, I think, quite positive in that, in that respect and making it go. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So Building Safety Act, Royal Assent, in, in, in April, published in May, enabling legislation. The building safety manager, he or she, had been removed. There were three statutory roles, principal designer, principal contractor, and building safety manager. The building safety manager was removed, presumably on the basis that um, very keen building safety managers in order to reduce liability would specify, over-specify fire safety measures. Again, that's a semi sort of political economic argument. Uh, but we were surprised at that, uh, that because you're implementing all of 53 of Hackett's recommendations, except maybe the ones you don't agree with. So there we are. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we've now got this regulatory framework. There's a nice, nice diagram there. And um, uh, we have obviously start on the left and work to the right. So we're now at the second box in. Bill has received royal assent. So this, that creates the legal powers to make or propose regulation. And there'll be formal consultation and draft regulation and so on. Um, regulation says regulations laid in Parliament near the bottom. That to be secondary legislation, which is now coming. And then there'll be a transition period in time for industry, not just industry but regulators and others to prepare for new regulatory requirements, and then they'll come into force. So you'll notice on that diagram, there is no, it's a timeline without any time on it. And if you look to the next slide, you will see a timeline, that's a rather spotty slide. And, and again, you will be able to see the, this is publicly available, this slide, you can get this. I, I don't, I, you know, it's, it's not something we've developed that you can't get. So where we are now is we're at Royal Ascent on the left, and there's a, awful lot of activity that's got to go on in the next 12 months and then in the next 18 months you've got to have the building advisory committee which takes over from the building uh, building regulations advisory committee mandatory registration of building inspectors the industry competence committee being established i'll talk a little bit more about like that later mandatory registration there's a whole load of things to do we've got gateways two and three 
the new bill coming to a force, we can, we'll talk about that later. Uh, and of course, the golden thread, the golden thread, which is going to be digital. I'm crossing my hands, my fingers on, on that model. Um, so there's a lot going on. I mean, we think, you know, say sometimes you see people say, well, there's nothing happened since Grimple. There's an awful lot going on, but it, there's, a, there's so much of it and it affects so many sectors of industry. It's not just the fire industry, the fire department, it affects the whole of, in, whole of the construction industry. There's a lot going on, it's gonna take some time. Next slide, please. A few other points of the, of the building safety bill. Um, the mentioned gateway stages and, 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 and statutory roles. Gateway one, pre-planning, which is i.e. planning permission, is already live, and well, we'll come on to that. Gateway two, which is permission to build, is not live yet, but gateway two and gateway three is, uh, is permission to occupy. And you have these phases and you can see the chain of responsibility moving from the client to the designer, principal contractor, to the building safety manager, even if he or she is not a statutory person. And also you will have a number of committees, including the building advisory committee, a construction products regulator, Andy will talk more about that later on, and the committee on industry competence, which I'll, I'll talk briefly about. And also there'll be a residence panel. One of the things that came out of Grenfell is, is the need to engage with residents, which didn't happen before. Next slide, please. So here we got the similar sort of slide. Hacker introduces the gateways. Gateway one is now active and 50% of submissions have been rejected by the health and safety executive. Now that is ringing alarm bells as well it should because when gateway two comes in, in January next year, main contractors are very concerned that they will be required to have detailed plans. It's a full plans for gateway two before they can build. This is not the way buildings are often constructed in this country, I'm using a process known as design and build. Uh, so Andy will talk a little bit more about that later, where a detailed design is, not, is, is undertaken by the main contractor rather than by the architect. We're moving back to what we used to do. Uh, I prefer the idea that you design something then build it rather than build it on the hoof. And that's why you get all these weird penetrations at funny angles and you think, who designed that? And the answer is nobody did because it wasn't designed. Um, but yeah, so gateway, uh, the gateways are coming uh, and gateway two will go live in, in early next year. And that's, that's, that's gonna be an interesting time because if we get a similar degree of rejection as we've got with gateway one, then the construction is going to grind, not to a halt, but it's gonna grind very slowly. And with that, I think we're on to the next poll question. And after that, I will hand over to Andy. So here we are. So here we are talking about design and build. Uh, do you think design and build can carry on? It's one choice. And you know, no, because Gateway 2 demands full plans, which effectively thwarts it. We need flexibility so to admit detailed plans as we go through the process. Yes, otherwise it will lead to excessive costs for leaseholders, building owners, etc. So this is more of an opinion rather than whether it's going to happen or not. So just See what you like and see where we go with that. So that will carry on. And then at some point, the pole master or the pole mistress, that doesn't sound good, does it? We'll, uh, we'll cease the poll and we'll get the results. And you've got nearly 39% no because get rid two. We need flexibility, slightly more, and yes, otherwise it will lead to excessive costs. So, so a slight preference for this, a bit of the status quo, but some realization that we need to change. Okay, and with that, uh, in this next section of the webinar, I'll, Andrew will take over. Over to you, Andy. That, that, that answer is really interesting, if only because, I mean, the 17% that says it's gonna to lead to excessive costs for leaseholders, and, and government says government says it wants to protect leaseholders from excessive costs, but at the yes. same at the same time it wants all these these this certainty and this stability. And it's how do we present prevent that from leading to all this certainty and stability and risk aversion that's come with it to 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 not end up with excessive costs for leaseholders. Right. Okay. 
I'm going to cow count it quickly through the next bit. It's not 25 past and we're about just under halfway through. Um, <clears throat> so Niall's already mentioned that we started talking about design with Gateway 2. And, um, and with sort of like Reba's plan of works already has comments in there in terms of project program that, that quite often the, the sort of like the concept design, technical, special coordination, technical design and manufacturing and construction, especially technical design and manufacturing and construction are all rolled into one. And they sort of like the projects fall through those stages as we stand. So, so we are going to see, we are going to have to see a, 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 certainly within, um, whilst there's been a lot of flexibility in the past about, uh, about those things, we are going to have to see um, some sort of better sort of more uh, staged approach as we go and, and consider these stages discreetly, because otherwise we are going to be running into problems at Gateway 2. I would not be surprised if that 50% from Gateway 1 ends up being a bigger number for Gateway 2. But then conversely, that's potentially a good thing because there's, we know that there is a massive quantity of rework done and or en technical evaluations needed, engineering um, reports needed, where construction produces things that can't be passive fire protected. And construction sort of tries to end up with something that, that, that is outside testing and, and certification. So that's that. Um, there is, of course, always this, this challenge that we come to in, in terms of design. What, who is the designer? Um, and the designer is, is here is somebody who makes a, a, you know, prepares, modifies the design, arranges for it, instructs it, you know, and, and, and so it, lots and lots of people end up with some form of design liability whether they realize it or not and that's something that we have to be mindful of as we go forwards because of course usually if you went to site and said well who's the designer that's the response you get it's somebody over it's him or a so so who is the designer and that can that's obviously that we need clarity going forwards with that, which at the moment we haven't got. But Gateway 2 may help, the proper implementation of Gateway 2 may help achieve that. So that's some of the stuff on Gateway 2 and some of the stuff on design. Okay. Moving on now, construction products regs. Um, construction products regulations provisions they're in section nine of the, the tucked away right at the end of the building safety bill on page 200 and something if you want to read that far through it and and of course what we what happens is that sec the secretary of state is given lots of powers to make regulations um and so we we one of the what, there are various things that and draft regulations that the secretary of state has already made in actual fact the secondary legislation that we're the draft secondary legislation that we're looking at today, most of it was produced at the time that um, Robert Jenrick was Secretary of State for Housing. Predates predates Gove and its implementation will come thereafter, probably in the the tenure of the next fella in, or lady after. Um, after we get through September's general, uh, sorry, September's leadership election and or the subsequent reallocation of cabinet roles. Um, but there you go. So for key things, first and foremost, is that the regulations will be underpinned by a general duty of safety. OK, and that's a that's a, an extension of a piece of consumer law going forwards. The second the other secondary legislation, the secondary legislation on um, safe on uh, safety critical products okay and so and that so it was published in the 15th of october last year and we're still waiting to see how that will change things uh, how that and how that legislation gets changed as it as it develops but government gave us this slide in about october last year and nothing pretty much has changed so in terms of um asfp product families there are three boxes there on the screen and hopefully you've you've all heard me say that say these this sort of thing before and the message is not changing the left hand box of the three 
is the general product safety requirements. Okay, it requires that construction product is safe before it's placed on the UK market. That will apply to everything, any construction product, from from a brick through to a boiler, through to a passive fire protection system. All, all construction products will have to comply with that. And we'll talk a bit about what that means on the next slide. The right hand box says we maintain the existing regulatory approach for products subject to a, a designated British standard, a former harmonized European standard. Right. In ASFP world, that means dampers. Dampers sit in the right hand box. So you already have to mandatory CE mark them. We had to mandatory CE mark them. Um, you will have to mandatory UKCA mark them. And we'll talk about the, the time frame for that switch from CE to UKCA before we get to the end of the session. And later, in the middle box here, you've got this statutory list of safety critical products. So government's going to create this statutory list of safety critical products. Secretary of State will add product families there will be a new product standard comes forwards and that will be a mandatory um, certification process. OK, and so there will be a mandatory, um, they, they will make a, a designated standard for these that sit in this middle thing where it's currently it's voluntary. Any marking is voluntary and that would they will end up with a, a mandatory system. So general product safety requirements, let's just talk about that briefly first. So in terms of the general product safety requirements, um, if you want to know about, about how to do that, there are two new publicly available specifications published by BSI, 7050 and 7100, and they are, they are in support of product safety. So they, are they tell you what you should be doing if you're, what to, to ensure that you are bringing safe products to market. And they are looking at things like um, risk assessments for your product, having a look at seeing at um, what sort of the, the, the you've put in place measures to identify the reasonably predicted uses for your product and that you are communicating how to use it in a safe manner. And then 7100 says, well, if we're aware of a, of a defect or we're aware of people using it in an incorrect manner, how are you going to respond to that? And what are you going to do with that? These are free to download on, from BSI's website. So, you know, go find, download, read. You do need to know these standards and be considering how you, how you are dealing with these going forwards because that's your, the general duty of safety. And of course, the, it, they're, they're published by BSI on behalf of uh, the Office of Product Safety and Standards, OPSS. They're our new construction products regulator. So in the event of people using a construction product and coming to harm, OPSS is the product will be the product regulator, and they're going to be using this as their frame of reference for, for what they want to see and what to make sure that the manufacturers have done this properly, considered risks and managed it properly. Oh, I've gone, gone too far. Um, then if we, so if we come on then from that safety critical products, this is the again you've seen this before this one comes from from government with for, uh, within um how they see the secondary legislation in october last year working so we the industry leaders propose a, a propose where products are to be and that's the um construction product steering committee it's called they'll propose products to be added to the safety critical list uh, BSI will be commissioned to revise, develop, test standards, product standards as necessary. Uh, we get an implementation period and then Secretary of State adds the product to the safety critical list, gives us a transition period uh, during which manufacturers can use the new standards voluntarily, but should be working towards because at the end of the transition period, the new product standard will become, becomes mandatory and there's a must comply on that bottom box. And we'll review on a regular basis and, and add and review products as necessary. So if we consider if we consider what we've just discussed, there's a, as far as we're concerned with ASFP, there's obviously a, a role for third party certification within the safety critical product side of things. There's obviously a role for third party certification within the existing um, regulatory framework that applies to dampers. 
there probably isn't in the general safety requirements, but that's just, I, I, to me, the general product safety stuff is stuff that you would need to consider as part of your, as manufacturers need to consider as part of their standard ISO 9000 type approach you know, and making sure it's safe as it, you put it onto the market. But there's a load of tasks there in terms of corrective action on unsafe products, a register of complaints, etc. So those are the, the sorts of things that, that we will have. But obviously, this does give us, we hope, um, you know, it's been a long served aim of the ASFP to have mandatory third party certification for products for passive fire protection. And this is a route, to, there is a route where we can see through here to get to it. Okay, so, so just to, you know, that's this, this is the secondary legislation I've talked about, um, uh, published October last year, as I say, it's the draft. It gets the catchy title of the Draft Construction Products Regulations 2022. Um, and it allegedly this is going to sit alongside the EU, the existing EU regulations, um, which were then modified when we left, when we left the EU, became the Construction Products Amendment E, etc. EU exit regulations of 2020. And so these two, these two things are designed to coexist. And this is how they will end up coexisting. You know, if you, can, if, you if you want to place a new product on the market, does it have a, a what was a hen, which is now a DBS? If so, yes, you have to follow that process, uh, and you also have to apply the safety critical. You also have to apply the current the, the, with that, and you also apply the GPS general product safety stuff. If it's safe, if it's not, you don't have a hen, but it's safety critical. You're into the new series of product standards beyond uh, beyond that and again you will have to comply with that and with gpsr but if it's not deemed safety critical then there's all better off the only thing you have to do is the general product safety regs okay um we've already mentioned that the uh secretary of state has powers to make regulations um, just we're just waiting for clarification of who that's going to be in the future. And actually, we've already seen that since Building Safety Act achieved Royal Assent, Secretary of State has used those powers to make some changes to approved document B Regulation 7 by changing the Building Act. Um, he's defined there are there's been thing to define new restrictions for uh, metal composite materials for buildings of uh, for use in external walls for buildings of any height, okay? Uh, no substantial material allowed above 35 megajoules per, per uh, uh, 35 megajoules per kilo uh, using the old bomb calorimeter test. Uh, definition of substantial as one millimeter thick or one kilo per square meter. And that is, it was laid uh, and made before parliament on in June, and that will go live in December 22. So on the 1st of December, that pretty much kills most of the of the polyethylene cord um, metal composite materials on the outside of buildings of any height. OK, of any height. So that's already that's already gone through. And the Secretary of State was able to make that regulation and pass it through Parliament very, very simply because of the powers given to him by Building Safety Act. Um, I'll just to touch briefly, I think this is the last couple of slides, touch briefly on, on the infamous UKCA marking where we go forwards. Um, so as we've said, now for UKCA marking, we, where we had a hen dampers, we can use the same standard um, as our designated British standard and damper manufacturers can go straight to UKCA using all that existing data. Where we used to use the OTA route and it was we did the voluntary CE marks, then UK um, assessment but over the technical approval bodies, no technical assessment bodies, I'll get that right. UK technical assessment bodies can make UK technical assessments. The ex, the, the um, European assessment documents that were uh, current at the time of exit have been listed on the government website, so they they and we can use those now. OK, now, UK government has said that CE marking will not be accepted in the UK, in Great Britain, 
after the end of this year. And I say Great Britain because Northern Ireland has a whole different series of provisions. Um, I, I'll give you a note of caution that this uh, is not yet underpinned by regulation. Um, and we were told no extension beyond this date, and that was repeated yesterday. Um, so on a webinar, it's that 2021 will not be repeated to beyond 2022. Okay, um, the, so so that's that's where we are. Um, we're waiting for the standalone piece of secondary legislation that's needed, but that still hasn't started. And I do wonder whether um, whether that piece of legislation will go through or where we'll end up, because of course with the issues regarding um, Secretary of State being changed, etc. So we, we keep an eye on that, um, but let, let's let we go. Um, it can happen because Building Safety Act has royal assent, uh, and it's the, the but again the legislation will be outside the draft CPR 2022 because government said they wanted to do it separately. Um, some industry sectors are now stay, saying that they still won't be ready for the end of 2022. And the last meeting we had on this topic, government said that we, in one forum, government said, well, we're considering it and we'll think about it. But yesterday we were on a, a webinar with, um, with DLUP and with BASE and they said, no, no more extensions. You've had enough time. It will be the end of 2022. Uh, finally, I'll just, I'll just point out one slide on this because this is really very complicated. Um, and of course, it's it, 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 to a most point now, it, it's irrelevant. Um, the European Commission has finally come up with a new draft version of its construction products regulation. It's only taken them about five, this review of, of it has only taken about five, six years. That text is out for consultation. Um, and I think that consultation period actually ended last week. The draft text that was out there um, is really complex, but it does keep roles for CN and EOTA, although it is will be possible for the Commission to go directly over their heads with a series of delegated acts. Um, there is, I think, the, the CEN route and the man standardization requests will still be the way forwards, but I think this is going to take many, many years to sort itself out fully. Uh, and equally, from comment from the, the European Commission was that if you looked at the draft text that they had in back in 2011, when they were doing the review and the change from CPD to CPR, um, there were still significant changes between where they wanted to be and where they ended up. And they expect significant changes to this draft now. So again, watch this space. I think the final point I would make here is that CPR in Europe is firmly about movement of goods in the European single market. Um, UK governments, but of course the stuff we're talking about in the in the in the UK is all about safety. And that's a there's a really subtle difference there because we've been talking more about product safety and building safety and using testing and, and and approval and assessments and whatever as a way of proving product suitability to make safe buildings whereas in Europe it's about making sure that products can move safely from market to market um the other thing we did ask um base and deal yesterday will they be adopting the European changes to construction products regulation going forward and they said no they won't necessarily have to they will decide on a case by case basis whether they're going to adopt the changes going forwards. And so I wouldn't necessarily imagine that they will be doing that. Um, I've, I'm, you know that many or all of you will have seen me talk about the fact that government committed to reviewing product tests for construction products in summer 21. Uh, that review took place. A guy called Paul Morell chaired it for them. A number of members met him several times and put information into him, and the report was due in uh, late in 2021. We're still waiting. Um, we don't know whether we, we may not even ever get to see that. But again, well, that report was meant to underpin a lot of the stuff on construction products. Uh, uh, the secondary legislation, it still says, will be underpinned based on the outcome of this report. We're still waiting. Uh, 
And finally, um, the construction products regulator. We've already mentioned that OPSS is our new product regulator. So OPSS will be working with trading standards. OPSS and the trading standards as a construction product regulator has powers to rectify problems, to I get manufacturers and installers to rectify problems, to put steps in place to prevent further harm for users and to rectify any systemic issues that are going on within um, manufacturers and stores. And all of that uses existing laws, as does the ability to look at misleading marketing claims. And um, they've been given a 10 million pound budget and they've put out a request for industry experts to sign on to a register to help with help them with issue resolution, because they're aware of the fact they haven't necessarily got the, the skills and the experience within that group. And of course, because that's been always been one of the problems with construction products regulation, that, that trading standards, it, this is just too complicated for general trading standards people. They need a, a, an expert pool behind it. So that's what they're doing about that. And so we, we, we sit here today, we've talked about OPSS, we've talked about general safety requirements, we've talked about safety critical products. Um, all of that centered on third party certification. We haven't talked about CCPI that did the last webinar for us. Uh, hopefully you, you're all aware of that, though it's still, that's still moving very slowly. But from our standpoint, we see third party certification of products as the central core that hopefully will bind all these things together. And if we can get all these things to, to work in that way, then third party certification should help smooth out all the other processes going forward, which takes me to poll question three. And hopefully you can see it on the screen any second now. There we go. So should the participation of products be compulsory and what level? The good news is they all say yes. Oh no, there's some no's coming in. I spoke too soon. So there we go. The vast majority, 52% say yes, and we keep good records. 43% thinking that yes, although we could do it better, and four. I think this is the first time they've heard of third party certification of products. Well, there you go now. I'm going to, I'll, I'm going to, uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to hand over to you and I'll let you um, do the next stint. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm going to have a quick rattle through competence. I mean, we have done whole webinars on competence uh, in passive bar protection because it's such a uh, embracing an all-encompassing subject, but I'm going to have a quick rattle through in the time we have available. Um, what's happening with competence, as I mentioned before, James Judith Hackett said, don't wait for government, but in fact, uh, in the building uh, safety bill, there are requirements for, for people to, you will basically have to demonstrate your competence. And the government set up uh, what's called a joint industry response group of the Construction Industry Council, that's the professionals, Build UK, that's the tier one contractors, and Construction Products Association, that's the manufacturers of construction products. Uh, they have performed 12 working groups in terms of like fire risk assessors and contractors and products and local authority building control and procurement managers, etc. And there are two reports, raising the bar in August 19 and setting the bar in October 2020. And setting the bar, I came up with two recommendations. For basically the professionals, that people working on buildings, like architects and surveyors, et cetera, would have to be registered or certified by a professional body. So they're similar to do it more, but a bit more formal and codified. In fact, there were some proposals for the professional body to be assessed by UCAS, but that didn't get very far, which I, I, I'm not surprised. But more down at the um, contractor end, uh, Working Group 2, which is a contractors group, which I sit on, that the industry should adopt a framework for all installer sectors working on in-scope buildings, that's high-risk building, that can be applied to other project types. And that consists of 
the bullet points accredited the third part certification, level two or level three qualifications, a card scheme like the CSCS scheme, refresh yourself and basic fire knowledge. And my always comment on that was well, that's very good, but that's not a conclusion. That's just a wish list. Well, which is it? Is it one of them? Is it all of them? Whatever. So that was a bit unsatisfactory, but things have moved on since then. Um, in addition, the, the, the HSC, that's the new regulator, will establish and maintain a committee on industry competence. There is an interim one working at the moment, and I'm presuming that the same people will move on to that, this new committee and they'll get rid of the word interim. Let's promote the competence of those working on all buildings. Competence is going to be based on SCEB. You probably heard, may have heard Andy and I talk about that skills, knowledge, experience and behavior. You can be very skillful and have lots of experience, but if you don't have the knowledge and you're not behaving well, it doesn't work. You need to have all four of those and they're addressed in the various competency frameworks. Next slide, please. Now, because of that, there, there's three main standards that came out of BSO. Well, four, include H670, a, 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 a framework for competency, as kind of draft template for competency framework. And then three drafts were produced for the three statutory roles, principal designer, principal contractor, and building safety manager. Yeah, of course, the building safety manager one is gone, uh, but BSI has published frameworks for those three. That's as far as it goes from a point of view of the standards and BSI. After that, it goes down to the industry. Well, who is the industry and who is going to do it? And, and how does it work? Well, the answer is all these working groups are going to set up bodies to create their own frameworks to cover their particular industry, whether it's procurement managers or, or whether, whether it's um, structural engineers or whether it's and so on. They're, so they have to do this competency framework in order to, to practice. So if we go to the next slide, and in terms of contractors, Working Group 2 has run six pilot projects. So you see you've got domestic heating and plumbing, dry lining, fire detection alarms, fire stopping, which is underlined and involved, rain screen cladding and roofing, underlined fire stopping, because that's obviously important from a fire perspective. And I am chairing that group. Uh, and uh, we're going, it's only just been set up and we're just getting the terms of reference sorted out. So the idea of these groups is they will set up and develop the competency framework for each area. They are then fed back and moderated by the competency steering group and then for implementation, quite how implementation occurs and what the level of, man, you know, whether it's mandatory or not, I'm not sure. I'm sure there will be something in there, but that's where we are with, with the brief uh, rattle through through competence in that area. Um, and, and that brings us on to poll question four, which should appear any moment. So I'm, in that very brief, brief uh, run through of competence, I'm, I'm sure you probably haven't had time to assimilate it all, but how do you think you understand what you need to do to be competent? Uh, don't be afraid if you if you answer the first one, which is, you know, I don't even know that I'm that, that I haven't addressed competence properly. How hard can it be? Or I need to do more, or I know what I need to do, or nobody can teach me anything. So, there are four stages on how you learn to do something. You start off with you know, the first bit, where Jeremy Clarkson on top here says, "How hard can it be?" And that means he hasn't a clue. Uh, and then you realise. I mean, I need to know a bit more about this and so on. So it's interesting to get, we've never asked this question before, so we'll, we'd like to see what we come up with. And hopefully we'll get the answer soon. I think we're, we're, we're there you go. So there's, there, there is one asking the how hard can it be, the, the Clarkson question, as we will put them. Um, well done, brave, brave person. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, oh, that's interesting. Sixty-six percent. Now, I thought the bias would be more. more I thought it would be the second one. Incompetent. I thought that would be the second. I thought that would be the second one. Say, I, I know. I'm. More. That's very interesting. Yes. It, and it, on it, that note, I it pass over to be Andy. really interesting to see how, how where, which sectors those answers came from. We can't because it's all anonymous. 
Um, but it would be really interesting to see what sec how, if there's a sectorial breakdown to how that that works. Right. OK, I'm going to last couple of three slides and we're nearly there because um, I'm just doing a, a wrap up. We started the, the webinar with a, a Dame Judith Hackett quote um, from Build a Safer Future that says you need to do we need to do it. We need to do it better. We need to be, get better at it. And we're going to end with uh, a Dame Judith quote. So and for those of you that haven't already, there is a um, health and safety executive the new building safety regulator publishes a monthly update and with one of the contributors to that hse monthly update is dame judith and this is taken from her june piece to the nation um and and you know basically say concerns that half the proposals at gateway one are, are having problems is a sad indictment of the fact that industry hasn't yet moved forwards and we need to we need to change. We need to get better at doing what we're doing, and um, so that's 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 that. You know, there is things to we do. So, you know, let's let's look and see how this how this thing goes forwards. Okay, um, and you know, the time for change is now. And as she's often said, don't wait for regulation. You know, this lot of this is coming, so let's do the right thing and do the right thing now, because we know what that's that's going to be. And so well, here we are. We've talked a lot about the Building Safety Act. Um, this was put a lot of this was put together last week in advance of um, the the AGM when the Lord Greenalch decided he was going to wait until Boris had resigned before he resigned. Um, but uh, this is this is where we are. You know, there's going to be significant changes in terms of approved design, how things are designed, how things are approved going forwards. There's going to have to be some changes to construct uh, design, how design and construction fits into the into the into the contractual process going forwards. There's going to be some significant changes to product regulations and all, and hope hopefully that will bring about third party certification. And of course, significant changes to how we all demonstrate competence. A, a, a lot of this depends on how we and you know, how we're going to get there, and and you know what the, the the government what the government's going to do and try and get through to this. Obviously, there's there's a lot that's been done in backplay, but it hasn't made big differences yet because the secondary legislation's not come into force. And then we haven't had the transition periods. So there's, there's, we could be quite a way away from getting through to getting through all these changes. So it's a big old oil tank we're trying to turn around here. Um, but that's where we get to, and that takes us to the to the questions and answers. So we've got a few questions and answers, Niall. Um, he says, um, "So are you are you ready for this? You're muted." I thought I pressed the unmute button, but I haven't. Okay, uh, so a couple of quick ones, really. Uh, first one, what are the requirements of a leaseholder who wishes to replace a flat front door? Assuming the door is common layer, are they obliged to the fire door set? Is, should it be third party certificated or should it be third party certificated installer? Or what powers does the RP have under the RRO? Uh, so the first question point is, if you are planning to replace a flat front door, you need to ask a leaseholder first. You may or may not have permission to do that, so you need to get that that sorted. Um, is it does it oblige? Does it have to be a fire door set to be in BSEN four BSEN BS four seven six part twenty two or the relevant European standard? It just has to be fire resisting. That's the answer. But it's a good idea if it's a door set that's been tested for BS476. And normally that's how you determine fire resistance, but whether it's actually a door set, and that's the whole subject of a webinar, is, an, is another matter. Installation by a third party accredited door installer, yes, it's a great idea, but it's not mandatory. What powers does a responsible person have to ensure compliance with the FSO? It's not so much powers as they are the duty bound to respond to the FSO. They have to take a fire risk assessment which is suitable and sufficient. And if the fire risk assessment says you need to do stuff, then you need to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm really going quickly because we're, we're, we're out of time. 
Uh, so you know you can't you can't ignore that. So you, you have to do that. But first thing is get the question done. Uh, next question I'm going to throw to you, Andy. Okay. Which is, an indication of when the the list of safety critical products will be publicly available and um, no we don't i mean the, the way that the, the the slide says that the system will work is that the, the legislation will have to come into existence the secretary of state will set up the and, and run this construction product steering committee they'll make recommendations and and, and the, the implication on the on the on the on the wheel of misfortune that we saw on that slide was the natural fact uh, a product won't hit that safety critical list until the product standard exists. Um, so there's, there's, you know, it's got to go through four hurdles before it gets onto the list. But obviously, it, it, you know, BSI would have to be drafting a product standard for something that's going to go onto the list. So, so I would have thought we would, it will be about um, 12, 18 months before we, we can, we know precisely that we you know we get the secondary legislation comes into force and at that stage we have the conversations with government about what's on the, the, the safety critical list i know when i've had conversations with people from um DLUC that 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 when i turn around to them and say passive fire protect all passive fire protection systems should be on the safety critical list i've yet to have one of them suck through their teeth and go oh i don't know about that um, you know, it, it seems logical that to me that all our product families are will end up on the safety critical list. Um, next yeah. question: Will there be a government-backed third-party certification scheme? I don't think there'll be a government-backed one, but third-party certification schemes are working together to harmonise some of their requirements and also to beef up some of the schemes to address some of the areas where they could be better. I think. Do you agree with that, Andy? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Moving on, uh, a comment uh, about the joint competence initiative for envelopes also exists. Yes. And no, I'm aware of it. I'm aware about that. It's published a white paper for consultation. Uh, a that, question. Is, sorry, just for, for my benefit, is that the, the, I mean, we presented on the slide about the, the WG2 competence groups that we're doing, and one of them was rain screen cladding. So is that JCI initiative for envelopes? Uh, no, I believe that's a separate group I, I being run by tier one contractors. And that leads on to the next question, which is how will you, we ensure the competence working groups are talking to each other to avoid conflicts and overlaps? Very good question. I think that's one of the biggest areas. A lot of people get great, we've got these standards, we're gonna go off and do our own competence framework, and then you're gonna have chaos. And that needs to be regularized somehow and some sense put into that. Okay. And final okay. question, oh, two more questions. Two, final question, will the recording this webinar be circulated review? It won't be circulated, but you'll be able to look at it on the website. You have a yeah. link on the website. And you'll it be won't, able to it won't be circulated, but we will send we'll out. Catch up TV. Yeah, you can watch it on, you can watch it on demand uh, uh, through, the ASFP, through the ASFP website when it's uploaded shortly. Um, and that takes us quickly to a reminder i've already seen i've already seen a, a request for um, a, a, a cpd certificate all the way from the green mountains of vermont and very nice it does look too although very early in the morning john um enjoy uh and beyond so you know please ping in info asfp.org.uk if you want a cpd certificate and then finally just to promote um two things Firstly, the, uh, in September, we're running a, a seminar at the Aviva building on 5th of September. Um, it, again, a lot of this, it will be a building safety act where we'll look to on develop some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. But on top of that, we are also, um, we're also going to be looking at launching our competency pathway. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Yeah, who's Flanagan and who's Alan? <laughs> I, I give up i give up and then the last one again uh asfp awards we are running our awards dinner on november the 20 awards dinner on november the 25th um and first of all uh reminder the awards categories are open have a look on the website you know nominate your uh, there's various categories that you can um, uh, can nominate companies for the awards including yourselves um and beyond that, there's also tickets available. And it was a sellout last year, 
was a complete sellout. We were, in fact, we were even turning uh, SFP council members away because they didn't manage to organise tables in time. So please, um, let's let's that. And that's the end of the show, folks. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, mm -hmm. hope we, we'll let uh, we'll see you again at some point in the future. All right. Cheers, Em. Thanks now. Bye bye. Very good. So when you've got to do a whole one on your own, that's a little bit more tricky. Yes. Uh, considering we was, I was modifying the presentation ten minutes. Still on. Oops, I thought I had.